Hello, I'm Sarah Barth, Executive Director of Semper Vigrants Fund. Thank you for joining us for another in our Under the Redwoods webinar series in which we explore the beauty and science and history and art uh, of all things Redwoods. Um, uh, we uh, do our work in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And as we always do, we like to start by acknowledging that the redwood forests in which we do our work uh, were among the ancestral lands for many indigenous peoples, people who cared for these lands and stewarded them actively for millennia until they were forcibly removed from those lands. And we are grateful today to work with their descendants including the Amamutsan Tribal Band and the Mwekma Ohlone Tribe to help restore their cultural and traditional relationships to these forests. Uh, I wanna thank Sharf Investments, who's been our sponsor for the year for this webinar series. We greatly appreciate their support. Um, and also uh, Shepherd Mullen Law Firm for their support of this particular episode. And I'd like to add that Shepard Mullen has been providing us pro bono legal services now for many years, and we are extremely grateful and fortunate to have their legal experts uh, supporting our work. Many of you are familiar now with our webinars. You know the drill. You can ask questions through our Q&A and chat function, uh, and we will get to as many of them as we can. And if we inadvertently give the audience questions short shrift. We'll try to follow up with them through email. Um, we are recording this event and it will be rebroadcast on our uh, website. So if you can't stay for all of it, or if you have folks who missed it but wanna watch it, it'll be available. Uh, I'm sitting here with you now and uh, outside the wind is uh, and the rain are coming down. Spring has sprung with a huge bang rather than a whimper. Uh, parks in our region are closed for safety reasons. A lot of our stewardship staff are not out in the field as they would normally be because although the redwoods are incredibly resilient and are doing fine with this weather, um, there are trees that are being toppled. There are concerns about mudslides and erosion. So um, in general, we've gotten a lot of questions about how the forests are doing. And in general, uh, rain is good in this region. Um, and in general, uh, the forests are withstanding these deluges just fine. Um, but it is an, a, a challenging and interesting new reality that we are dealing with. And it's one reason I'm especially excited about our topic today. We are going to be talking today about how Semper Virens Fund and, and our partners as well, but we're really gonna focus primarily today on our own thinking about this, how we are responding to these climate change realities, how we are uh, refining the way we think about how we protect and prioritize protection and how we steward the forest for which we are responsible. And I don't want to suggest that we haven't been thinking about climate. We're not new to this, and it's been clear for decades that climate change was happening. But probably like many of you, it's hard to avoid, whether you're in California or elsewhere, um, the fact that the impacts of climate are becoming so dramatic and so evident so quickly. And in our region, this audience has heard us talk about wildfires, drought, uh, and now the, the endless deluge of rain and wind. Um, and so it has caused us to really sharpen our focus on this question and try to think about how we incorporate uh, this new reality uh, or a greater understanding of this reality into our work. And, you know, often what we present to you at these webinars is people with expertise who come and give you what they think the exact answers are. You're not doing that today. We're going to share with you our best thinking and be transparent uh, in saying that we approach uh, climate change and the realities of climate change with faint humility uh, and we're going to share with you kind of um, look under the hood of the organization, how we're thinking about it, how we're incorporating the latest data, and be honest with you that this is going to be an ongoing process because we and everyone else are learning as we go and we will continue to adapt our protection strategies and our stewardship strategies as new and better understanding continues. And I can't think of a better time 
um, to sort of be transparent with all of you about uh, what we do know and what we don't know, but we're aware is changing. So that said, we're gonna to talk to you today about a climate action plan that we've been developing. That is our sort of response to this uh, and um, share with you a bit about what some of the latest data is telling us about climate and its impact on redwoods. Uh, the climate action plan is something that you can find on our website. There'll be a link to it in the chat uh, if you wanna take a closer look at it. Okay, so to join us today and talk to us about these issues, I'm really excited. We've got Laura McClendon, our longtime Director of Conservation, uh, who is steeped in all things redwood conservation uh, and has been with the organization for quite a while. Um, and you've probably seen her in some of our events previously. Uh, we are also joined today by Tom Robinson, who is uh, has been advising us uh, as a consultant on these how to incorporate the latest climate data and research. And Tom is a, uh, he has many things. He's been an advisor for decades to us and others in the Bay Area around land conservation and um, planning around land management, application of GIS techniques to land management. He's been an incredible asset to the larger conservation community in the Bay Area region for a long time. And he's also currently a professor at Sonoma State, but he's so much more than that. So in any case, uh, we, are, we are joined by two very um, redwood wise and thoughtful people. So with that, welcome Laura and welcome Tom. I'm gonna turn it over to the two of you. Thank you so much, Sarah. And yes, very exciting to be here um, with Tom today. He and I have been working together for a couple of years now on some of the behind the scenes climate change uh, data in our land acquisition and stewardship planning. And that's what we intend to share with you all today is kind of a look behind the scenes of how Simper Environments Fund is utilizing climate change data um, in, in our land protection and stewardship prioritization. So we know that redwoods play a key role in climate resilience of, in this region, especially they create kind of their own weather, their own climate. They reduce direct exposure of sun to the forest floor, capturing fog, but they recharge aquifers. And they are the best species in the world at sequestering carbon, um, more tons per acre than, than any other species can achieve in their lifetime. Um, so key to this is a question around how do we help redwood forests continue to provide all of these sort of the green infrastructure services um, for people, plants, and wildlife in the region um, with a changing climate? How do we help redwoods not only persist, but thrive with all of the, the, the changes in our climate and the uncertainties that we face as well? So our main tools at Simper Virons Fund and our conservation toolbox are uh, land protection, which is buying land and conservation easement or timber rights, and land stewardship, which is taking care of the land. Um, conserving land keeps forests intact, functioning properly, reduces watershed stress, allows redwood forest species to migrate across the landscape um, and topographically. And our stewardship efforts keep invasive species at bay, address erosion, and improve water uh, watershed function and reduce uh, wildfire fuels. So that's a lot. And there's a lot of land out there that still badly needs conservation and active stewardship. So we have a uh, perennial question, which is how do we best prioritize our time and resources to protect kind of the best pieces out there to ensure Redwood's survival um, and, and, and persistence and well into the future. Um, and how, how do we prioritize land protection through a climate change lens? And we've been digging into this um, in the last couple of years, especially since the 2020 CZU fire that we had in the Santa Cruz mountains, which was the most devastating fire on record there was a time before the fire and there was a time now that we're in after the fire and climate change became very real. And certainly this winter as well with the storms we're dealing with, um, it's been relentless and we're seeing, you know, some pretty big impacts across the landscape, especially in the burned areas. So this is 
a new approach to simpervirins. It's not entirely, we're not building off of, you know, something that didn't exist before, but that said there, you know, we are trying to incorporate the best data we can into our planning. Um, we traditionally use more ecologically focused data of, of what we knew was on the ground at a certain point in time. So like what, what plants are there, you know, where the rivers and creeks are, what watershed are we in, and prioritizing around existing ecological resources. With uh, this new planning effort though, we're considering, um, you know, how do we build in resiliency um, as a factor that we want to consider in our acquisition planning and stewardship planning. And in a term we're calling stewardship space. So recognizing that lands that uh, lands need active stewardship, especially our, our second growth redwood forests. And um, how do we incorporate that need into our prioritization rather than shy away from, oh, it's gonna be a lot of work to help nature help itself. No, we're not taking that stance. We're, we're saying like, we need, to, we need to act. We need to prioritize the lands that really need, need our help. Um, with great humility though, we're not saying that we we're gonna do everything perfectly or right, but, um, and we're certainly following best practices and the latest science out there. So we've also expanded climate change data modeling to include um, sophisticated models of species flow, plants and animals, you know, across the landscape, obviously plants moving much more slowly than the animals. Um, and this is all under the umbrella of the, our new climate action plan, which you can find the website link in our chat. Um, so sitting along kind of the tried and true forest and wildlife priorities that we have traditionally used to prioritize our land protection, we are, as I said, incorporating stewardship and resilience priorities and using new science um, and map data to identify these priorities. So before I get into that, um, Tom, uh, I know you work with a number of groups in the area, Together Bay Area, Bay Area Conservation Lands Network, um, and I just want to start with asking you before we get into the data that you and I have been working on um, and analyzing, what are you hearing and seeing how others in this area are tackling climate change in the conservation world? Mm. Well, thank you, Laura. And I want to say it's an honor to join you um, and be a part of the Under Redwoods uh, webinar series. I've really enjoyed um, uh, watching the webinar series. It's just a, a treasure trove of information. So thank you all for, for, for doing the series. It's great. So I'm really honored to be a part. Um, and that's a great question. Um, uh, as you mentioned, uh, I have a, um, I'm like fortunate enough to have a role with um, Together Bay Area as its uh, lead for the, the Bay Area Conservation Lands Network project, which is a, um, a regional project that incorporates, um, that includes the nine county Bay Area and um, Santa Cruz County. So kind of a 10 county eco region. Um, and the Conservation Lands Network project is um, very much like a grassroots project that um, like uh, lives and thrives based on contributions from practitioners and scientists from all across that region. Um, and uh, it's a sort of a central hub, if you will, for um, science and data related to conservation planning. And unsurprisingly, in our last update, the CLN 2.0, which um, launched at the end of 2019, um, climate change was a big um, kind of uh, focus of that of that launch. And in that uh, update, we incorporated um, some key data sets primarily from the Nature Conservancy of California, which have been pioneers um, in sort of reaching into the science and um, uh, the concepts and bringing it down to the ground in, in the form of, of maps and data, um, some of which we'll, we'll look at today. Um, but in that role, and then also my role as a, um, a lead of my own consulting business, um, I've had the luxury and chance and, and, and uh, um, privilege to work with um, several organizations from around the Bay Area. And what I'm finding is that 
Um, we're all in the same boat. Um, we're, but, but uh, it, it, kind of interestingly enough, folks are coalescing around science that is basically supporting the idea that you should keep doing what you're doing. We are collectively adding resilience every time we do the stuff that we've been doing for decades. Every time we, um, uh, you know, prevent further degradation of the natural world, and in particular of all the various sort of ecosystem processes and functions that keep the natural world um, knitted together and working. Uh, every time we do that, every time we steward land, as you mentioned before, um, you know, uh, removing invasive species and um, addressing uh, erosion, uh, human-caused erosion, and other impacts, um, we're strengthening the ability of the natural world to sort of um, buffer and respond to and recover from the impacts of a changing climate. But the science that we're all coalescing around, I think, um, says, yes, continue what you're doing, but also take into consideration two things for the future. And that is uh, ensure you're, you're um, conserving. And that when I say conserve, I think we all know at this point, conserve means you know, uh, preventing future degradation uh, through some sort of um, restriction of human activity there. Um, especially habitat destruction uh, like like uh, activities, but and but stewarding those lands for maximum function as well. So you know those are the two sides of the coin that I don't ever want to um, uh, um, uh, mistake or, or not joined at the hip. Um, so areas that allow migration into and out of a given region, um, because as you mentioned on the outset, species are going to need to move, whether they're animal or plant species, right. and you need to shift in and out of an area. We're, we're in the Santa Cruz Mountains are going to receive species that perhaps were not in great abundance here uh, before, and species that are, in, are, are here now may need to shift and find suitable habitat elsewhere. And, and um, uh, several scientists are calling these climate corridors for short, migration routes. The second thing are places that are expected to not change that much. So these are uh, also called refugia. Um, and so understanding and under, uh, where those are, conserving them and stewarding them for maximum function. That's what I'm finding folks are really coalescing around. And I think that we can kind of step back and think, all right, um, that sounds like a no regret strategy. Um, there are also, there are other strategies that are more, um, maybe you might call them sort of um, cavalier, um, assisted migration of species, things like that. And I think that I, what I'm finding at least is that most conservation organizations in the Bay Area um, are just now, they fully understand climate change is happening, but we're, we're just now figuring out what the data are saying and how to respond and incorporate them into our are already kind of well-oiled, um, you know, sort of processes of conserving land. Yeah, exactly. I'm finding that we're not necessarily um, doing something completely new and different in terms of uh, our main conservation tools, mm -hmm. but that they're better prioritized and informed by uh, this new data and new understanding. So when, when and if we have to make hard decisions of, you know, limited time, limited resources, uh, to you know, in dollars, we we're making really the best informed decision we can um, uh, when we have to. That's 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 it exactly. And you use the word "we" there many times. So I have a question for you. A quick follow up. <laughs> um, uh, one of the things that um, is really unique to the Santa Cruz Mountains is the Santa Cruz Mountain Stewardship Network. And I'm curious if when you use the word "we," are you talking about obviously? Semper Virens, maybe the sort of conservation community writ large, but how does your thinking about climate change and the ways we sort of need to adapt our processes from a, almost a business standpoint, how does the stewardship network, your involvement and the Semper Virens involvement kind of, um, uh, how, how does the stewardship network uh, influence all of those? 
I'm curious. Yeah, thanks. I mean, this the Santa Cruz Mountain Stewardship Network was formed um, about nine years ago mm -hmm. um, by Simper Virons, but really is is coming to its own. It's a it's a, a association of about 25 land managers and agencies across the public and private and nonprofit sectors um, covering, you know, as much of the Santa Cruz Mountains landscape as we can. And we get together in person, we do lots of Zooms and sharing of best practices and really strategizing on how can we leverage um, our partnerships as a whole to um, and across property boundaries to really manage things on a landscape level and um, not lose sight of, of the, the forest for the trees and mm -hmm. um, really uh, kind of pilot some, some new types of projects. I mean, a, a group of us got together and are, are doing um, some, you know, we're doing more controlled burning than we have, for mm -hmm. example. Um, and trying to expand that tool in our toolbox and coming across, you know, the, the limitations and liability and things like that and trying to figure out, okay, how do we break down those barriers? And it's really in this group context and collective that we're able to not only think through solutions, but actually enact solutions um, mm -hmm. and, and leverage each other's strengths to, to make things happen on, on, on the ground. Um, and we looked at the stewardship you know, I, I remember looking at literally at a map about 10 years ago and saying, okay, if we're successful and we can turn, you know, all this land from unprotected to protected in some way, meaning, you know, no further degradation development, um, then what? You know, we mm -hmm. need to really step up our collaboration game. We really mm. need to figure out how to work across different agencies, um, as I said, public and private, um, and timberland owners as well, um, and steward these resources uh, collectively. So that mm -hmm. ethos has definitely been building and is there, and it's um, leading to all sorts of collaborative projects on a level that I've never seen before. It's a real model and a real success story. And it also blends into the topic that we're gonna talk about today, which is data. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the Stewardship Network has been uh, instrumental in facilitating the collection of some pretty phenomenal data to serve everything that you've just been talking about. If, if we can, for this, the rest, the remainder of this webinar, just sort of um, take as truth that climate change adaptation equals stewardship. It, it, it has to equal stewardship. Um, the Stewardship Network is doing a great job of everything you just mentioned, but also like, all right, what what kind of 21st century data do we need to um, answer some of these questions about where do we allocate resources? So with that, should we look at some data? Let's look at some data. Okay, sounds good. Well, um, while I'm kind of getting my uh, bearings with the uh, Zoom here, I just wanted to say, well, working with you, Laura, um, I, I kind of have a, a new appreciation for the role stewardship plays in overall conservation. I've always considered, as I mentioned, stewardship as the key to real conservation. Mm -hmm. um, but working with you, especially on the heels of the CZU um, fire, really opened my eyes to how we might actually use data to sort of realize um, those, those future needs, the needs of like the, the, the migration, uh, climate corridors, and those refugia. Um, let me share my screen because we're going to need to do that to share data. And the first thing um, I want to look at is this idea of stewardship need. And I, I, this is one of those areas that um, I, I get get me most excited about working with you all is, is this the pivot that you talked about, this, this desire to say, well, no, we're, we're going to start to look for the problems. And yeah. we're going to say, what, is, what does it look like to, to sort of, you know, uh, not go quietly into that breach, as it were. Um, and as you and I were talking, uh, again, especially in the heels of the CZU fire, um, and, I, you know, we were talking about what are the key issues what rose to the top were, um, were really just sort of post-fire, uh, that, that huge disturbance. Uh, what are some of the ways that we can learn from it 
and recover from it. And one thing you you said that was really great was, um, here's what I'm concerned about. We spend all this time and effort conserving this stand of forest because it has marble murrelet and it's old growth and it's connected to this, this and that. But I'm worried about what's up the fire shed. You know, if there are prevailing winds and we know um, that fire spreads, what fire could catch somewhere else and come to the, the place that we've invested in? And how can we help that patch? And so the um, uh, we looked around for information to sort of maybe identify some of those spots. And um, this is this is one of the things where I just feel so good about public investment into um, data collection. And that's a wildfire suppression difficulty index by the U.S. Forest Service. And this yeah, really explain, gets, explain that yeah. more to us. You bet. Um, <laughs> so essentially what we're talking about here is if you were looking from uh, the standpoint of uh, uh, where could my, you know, my firefighting battalion find a lot of trouble, that same question actually answers to a certain degree, your question about where should I be concerned about fire starting and getting out of control and, and perhaps um, affecting um, places that we've invested in. And so what this index does is it's, it's, it's all relative based on a, a several factors that are really important. The first is obviously topography. Um, we know that fire behaves a certain way based on topography. It behaves based on the types of fuels and the amount of fuel there. Um, and then the expected behavior under severe fire weather conditions. So we're starting to see the ingredients. Yeah. Um, and then uh, this is a lot of fire science that I'm brand new to, but I, I really thank the folks who have spent their time dissecting and understanding this world. But the idea of firefighter line production rates in various fuel types. That's well studied and incorporated into this index. And then finally, accessibility, um, the, the distance from um, roads and trails. All of these sort of um, form a, a way for us to um, map out, you know, the red areas that you see on the map are, they're high, they're high difficulty for suppression. And then the blue areas are places that it's easy to suppress fire. And of course, um, what I want to just mention here is that we're we're not um, coming at this from a suppression standpoint. We're coming at this from a stewardship standpoint. So, what are some of the implications for your work? Well, of course, they would be that those those areas where where we're seeing you know kind of those red areas near places that Semper Virens has either um, invested in or cares about or the community cares about. Um, how can Semper Virens work with those landowners to preemptively reduce wildfire fuels, improve access to places where um, fuel reduction work would actually reduce the risk to key forest stands. So this is a, um, a, a the first to my knowledge of actually incorporating something like this that's, that's a tried and true data set in fire science, but in conservation. And then of course, the other side of this is what happened with the, um, with the fire and recovery. And we have good data for that as well. Um, this is um, a, a data set that was actually produced by um, MidPen um, using tried and true methods of using satellite imagery to determine kind of um, where the soil was really cooked in, um, in the CZU file, uh, fire. And as we know, high soil burn, it, it alters the soil chemistry, it kills roots and important fungi, it decreases slope stability, um, and increases exposure to rain and sun later on. Yeah, and, and so, what I yeah. wanted to interject in that um, you and I were talking earlier before this webinar, uh, I looked at this, you know, this map and thought, gosh, I know anecdotally in these areas of high burn severity, there's a lot more soil movement happening, um, erosion, roads, you know, falling apart, um, landslides um, that wouldn't be happening at, at, the, at that intensity had this mm -hmm. fire not occurred. That's anecdotal. We don't have like, the, the data sure. isn't in yet, but my strong feeling there's, there's an overlap 
from what I've been hearing on, you know, where the fire was worst and where we're seeing kind of the worst impacts in terms of um, soil movement and erosion and landslides. Indeed. And, and even if we just took that idea that, you know, the greater the soil burn severity, the greater the stewardship, stewardship burden might be. Um, and so just to your point, you know, some of the implications are uh, landslides and soil loss, um, soil restoration, uh, re vegetation reestablishment. Uh, so now we're getting a, a, a way of starting to look at the landscape through a lens of stewardship where we have an idea of relative, um, you know, uh, need. So these are just two examples of looking at it from a kind of maybe a proactive, like let's get into those, those places. And then what are some ways we can assist recovery as well? So um, the other part of what we've been talking about, Laura, is this idea of climate uh, change resilience. Right. Um, and I think it would be great if we could, um, you know, dive into that and, um, and show folks, you know, kind of what are some of the really interesting data sets that are um, getting at climate change resilience. And I just want to mention that, once again, we're really, really fortunate that groups like the Nature Conservancy of California and others um, have really done a, quite a phenomenal job of going to, into the literature and of, of primary sources. We have decades of academic um, uh, conceptualizations of climate change, the idea of resilience, um, and, and practical guidance for conservation practitioners like us um, for adapting to our, our, our landscapes to climate change. But there's often, um, there's a couple of linkages, as you well know, between uh, uh, primary sources and papers in academia and on the ground decision-making. Um, one of those linkages, that one of those kind of gaps, the, the, the science to practice gaps that needs to be filled is what you're looking at right now, which is, okay, we're gonna deploy those concepts use our best data science um, techniques, and we're gonna map it out um, and, and see what it looks like. And the Nature Conservancy has pioneered this work of looking at the idea of landscape resilience and mapping it out. But what does resilience mean? Resilience, of course, means, as we all know, the ability to recover after a disturbance and, and to achieve a former state. Um, so you take a hit and you keep on ticking. And so what are some of the ways that the landscape does that? Obviously, landscapes are really great at that. The disturbances are absolutely part of a dynamic and, and thriving landscape. But the level of impact and the level and the degree to, of disturbance that we are currently experiencing and are projected to experience with a changing climate are such that we are talking about what are called stand replacing kinds of events, where you maybe take a hit, and there's no going back. And the humans have obviously a role to play in the ability for a landscape to not come back. We tug at the fabric of the landscape and when we disintegrate it, then it has a less, less of a chance of getting back to that former state. But on the flip side, through stewardship and acquisition, we actually can improve its ability to come back or forestall you know, um, uh, that the ultimate um, change from say a stand of redwoods to a stand of um, coastal shrub. So what are some of the ways that we can look at the landscape and map it such that we get a sense for, um, for resilience and understand how humans can actually play that beneficial role? Well, the Nature Conservancy has looked at a couple of different variables like topoclimatic diversity. This is basically just in a given area, are there lots of different facets in the landscape? And if, if you look at it from um, a flower's perspective or a small mammal's perspective, you're used to a certain climate, that climate changes, it gets more arid, it gets more exposed, what do you do? Well, if you don't have a really far place or a far distance to travel to access another suitable habitat because the landscape is so diverse, then you have a better chance of survival. And that diversity is actually an inherent quality of the landscape that increases its resilience, its relative resilience. Another thing is just natural land cover types. Um, they have 
regulating um, services and buffering services. Another one is just the lack of human activity, keeping um, uh, our sort of um, our, whether it's pollution or it's non-native species that invade um, natural land cover. Another one is long distance connectivity. It's, okay, it's all well and good to be nice and natural and diverse in a little patch, but if you're not connected far away, then, then you're disconnected and you don't actually have um, uh, a, a good chance of being resilient. And so um, it, you, need, you need sort of um, connectivity to be resilient. And so what you're looking at on the map is perhaps unsurprising to most people in areas that are, you know, high diversity, high natural cover, a lack of human activity, and are, are, are relatively well connected, oh, then you're going to have high resilience. And then uh, conversely, you're gonna have low resilience if you um, have um, you know, low scores for any of those factors. So how does this um, affect stewardship acquisition? Um, you know, what, what an organization like Semper Virens wants to do is look at how can we maintain near and long, di long distance connectivity? What role can we play in keeping those green places green? Um, how do we improve natural land function within those green places? How do we maintain those hydrologic connections, the stream and, and, and groundwater connections that keep a place moist and um, buffered from the effects of aridification, for instance? Um, or how do we keep invasive species from um, replacing native species that are um, um, evolved to be there? And how do we in, uh, maintain habitat diversity? Because as we all know, a diverse habitat is a more resilient habitat. So that's one big chunk here that um, you know, we've been uh, beneficiaries of some really great work. Another piece is this idea of climate corridor. So we're looking even further out here. And the idea here is um, that climate corridors are areas that are important for climate change driven movement. What that means that is that as the climate changes, species are gonna to need to migrate in and out of an area. And when they migrate, they're going to need suitable habitat as they go. So this is about connectivity between natural lands in the present climate and natural lands with future analogous climate as well. And again, this is really great work done by the Nature Conservancy and their partners. And um, furthermore, these roots need to sort of follow climatic, um, to like topo climatically diverse roots. Um, just as we talked about before, you want resilient um, uh, roots. Now this map is quite something to behold. Um, and it's using some really neat um, uh, science behind it. It's not actually looking at any given species and its requirements. What it's looking at is sort of if you were to just think of um, the collection or the mosaic of species in an area and um, the types of habitats that they've evolved to prefer, and you look at other analogous habitats, what's the connectivity between those? Um, and where we don't have a lot of ability to move, you're gonna see white space on this map. But where there's the ability to move, you're going to see some color. And there's a couple of shades here and a couple of colors here. The darker the shade, the fewer options the species in that area have to migrate. So the darker the shade, the more important that patch is for general movement. And you can literally think of these species as holding the genes of evolution. And you can look at these pathways here as like the flow of, of genetic um, of genes. The other aspect here is the uh, a yellowish um, color. The more yellow is, um, those are areas that are gonna be important with changing climate. These are um, areas that will remain um, suitable. Uh, maybe they're refugia or they are areas that um, will actually uh, tend to become um, a, a corridor because of, of, of the, the habitat changes there. Yeah, Where fascinating. Um, yeah. So Tom, 
I'm doing a time check on us. So um, yeah. let's share our our tall trees uh, data set really quickly. And then I'd love to invite Sarah back to have a discussion about um, what we've been talking about and, and showing with this data. Sounds great. Yeah, another um, uh, uh, one, one thing I just mentioned is that obviously the implications here are improvement of habitat function and, and climate corridors is the work exactly. that, that Semper Virons and their partners can do. So yeah, sounds great. Let's um, just look at some of these uh, neat data that are um, that are coming out of the LIDAR that's been collected as part of the stewardship networks um, um, kind of collectivization of the investment in, in some great uh, environmental data sets. And what this allows us to do is identify patches of tall or old growth forests in a, a way we've never been able to before. And the colors you see, the darker the, the, the green, are the taller the canopy of the forest. And we can literally sort of pluck out where we're getting really tall forests. And this map um, shows where we're seeing stands of forests that are 125 feet or above. So this is a... Um, uh, you know, I know for folk, for you, Laura, and others working in this region, this is really eye-opening and kind of a bit of a, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a wish list item that's been out there for a long time. It is, and it, it points to kind of where those refugia are already and, um, you know, where we're going to find the healthiest, most intact groves of um, second growth and old growth redwoods as well and yeah. how to better connect them. Um, or expand upon them or, you know, prevent disturbances uh, such as development or catastrophic wildfire from drastically altering their survival. Indeed. So I'd like to invite Sarah back with us to have a discussion about any and everything we have just gone over. It was a lot, but um, I'm sure we have a lot of good questions to cover. Well, I want to really, first of all, thank you both. And um, Semper Virens has, to my knowledge, always been informed by science. Uh, so this is a continuation of past practice for us. But there is so much new research coming out, fast and furious, that uh, I'm just really grateful to both of you for helping to keep us current. Uh, but I really want to, because I'm guessing this audience is most interested in the so what question. Um, and I heard you say at the very outset that one of the things you're learning and that the, the, the research is affirming is that we should kind of keep doing what we've been doing. Okay, if that's the case, then why is Semper Virens bothering with all of this analysis? So I would like to hear from both of you, and you've touched on it a bit, which is what does it mean for us as an organization? How does it inform our strategies? But I'd really like to hear it in the form of um, what you think success for our organization looks like. In the past, success for our organization was protecting as much acreage uh, of redwoods as possible and with a particular emphasis on old growth. And, um, and that has led to the creation of a number of parks in our region and protected areas. Um, how is the world for us different? You have You guys have touched on it a little bit, but, you know, when, when our grandchildren are looking back on this era and say, this was the era of Semper Virens in which X was accomplished, what do we want that to be? What is different um, in your minds than what you might have answered five or 10 years ago? How is this all this climate consideration changing the way Semper Virens should define success? I can try to take a step. Either one of you can take a crack. Yeah, I think, I mean, for me, it really opens up uh, the, or indicates the importance of our ongoing stewardship and management of these lands. Um, you know, our history goes back to the days when we were, the dire threat was clear cutting. That doesn't exist anymore in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Most of the old growth has been protected, although there's still some key patches that we're hoping to protect and are high priority for us. Um, but what's even more important is restoring certain ecosystem functions to the landscape that were here pre-colonization and through you know, fire suppression, fragmentation, all of these changes to the landscape and now future you know, disturbances through climate change. Um, it's more important than ever that we have more boots on the ground 
um, not just monitoring change, but actually like doing work to reduce fuel loads, to restore old growth conditions, to get these trees bigger or faster so that they can be more resilient in the face of climate change, which is just filled with uncertainty. Um, so that that is really what I see as being different is just the build out of resources around land management and stewardship. Um, we will be successful in protecting these lands. I truly believe, I mean, if we can't do it here, with all the you know money and and um, brain power we have in the, the Greater Bay Area, um, so then what? Then we have to manage these lands, and it's it's done as I said with a great amount of humility and not necessarily assuming um, we're going to have some unintended consequences. And so we need to be very careful too about not kind of overdoing it. And we're not talking about treating every acre of land, but really honing in on um, specific strategic areas like where where a fire break can be put in to um, either prevent or, or um, slow down a catastrophic wildfire, for example. We want some level of fire. We don't, we don't want this huge conflagration like we had in 2020. Tom, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, uh, just underscore underscore, underscore, underscore what you just said. Um, and one thing I would just um, comment on is you mentioned the word uncertainty. One, one metric of success, I think, for Semper Virens and, and its, its partners is um, the embrace of uh, courage and um, the idea that uh, some of these topics that we talked about today are pretty esoteric. You can't go out there and see landscape connectivity, and you certainly can't see climate corridors. They aren't colored yellow on the land. So there's faith um, that needs you need to have in order to sort of adopt and, and adjust your thinking and your planning based on the current science. So I think one of the, one of the um, measures of, of, of success would be we're doing this because it's better than doing nothing at all. And we we believe that things are changing and they're gonna change more and we're gonna we're gonna be proactive about it. Yeah. I will tell you my own take on things. So mm. I will toss this out there. You guys can kick it around and tell me if it's wrong or or right. Um, listening to you all and just thinking about it again, it's not that these are new topics for us. It's just yeah. really coming to sharper focus for many of us, given what's happened in the last few years. Yeah. One is I always feel urgent about our work, but you know, your research, seeing what's happening on the land, looking at what's happening internationally, the UN report that just came out, it could really depress you. And instead, what I feel is, oh man, we just need to scale up the scope and pace of our work like massively um, to, to help these landscapes be better prepared. Now that might sound convenient to somebody listening to this more cynically, oh yeah, just do more of it. But I do feel like there's a scale issue that we're talking about and we're increasingly yeah. understanding that the scale needed for resilient conservation is larger even than we had understood. Um, let alone the connectivity. So that's one thing is I just mm -hmm. feel greater and greater urgency about scaling up. And then the second thing is, I think I'm hearing you say that the indicators of success for us as an organization may be in addition to our typical acreage or miles of river protected or, or all growth that's protected. In addition to that, we, we may need to be looking at metrics around um, other habitats that are important because they're going to be future redwood habitat, mm -hmm. or they are connective, as you were saying, the climate corridors, Tom, and that we need to begin to incorporate those into our metrics of success. And as we're doing with this, help our supporters understand that we may be uh, purchasing land that's currently oak woodlands, but it's going to be important to make sure the redwood corridor and all its species are connected to the larger landscape and viable over the long term. And that's a very different way of thinking that, mm -hmm. that if you love redwoods, you may need to protect these other kinds of habitats um, because that's where they're, that's where redwoods are going to be in the future. Um, 
Am I thinking about these things in the right way? Is that part of how our work needs to change and how we define success changes? Take it away, Laura. I would just say, speak to, speaking to the, I'm in agreement with everything you were saying, Sarah. Um, and uh, we were joking, you're gonna throw me some curveballs, and no, I mean, we're like minds in this. Um, it's not just protecting lands that aren't redwoods that could become redwoods, because we don't know precisely, yeah. right? And um, we don't want to assume to know, oh, let's put some redwoods here where they weren't before. Um, but we know that by protecting biodiversity and a diverse um, number of ecosystems together in aggregate leads to a healthier, more resilient landscape yeah. overall. So we do prioritize protection of like oak woodland and grassland where we can. There's just the dominant species and veg vegetation type in our region is redwood. Um, but it's still equally important uh, to protect, you know, pocket meadows and riparian corridors and areas that really are really rich in species diversity um, and help with ecosystem function because it all ties together and helps, you know, the whole. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing that seems different, sorry, and then I'll let you answer too, Tom, but oh, listen, no, please. Laura, um, you know, we have already started to move in this direction, which is species reintroduction or restoration of habitat specifically for imperiled species. So this audience has heard us talk about the work we've been doing to support um, salmon and uh, steelhead and right. some of the watersheds that we manage. We are developing now a project that I'm sure we'll share with this audience around reintroduction of some um, endangered frog and turtle species by, by creating and restoring some wetland ha habitat. Um, and that hasn't, you know, when you guys talk about stewardship, I think you mean not only things like forest management for fire and fuel reduction, but also things like that, that are much more hands-on, uh, whereas the Semper Firens of the past, I think would have said, let's buy land, protect it, make it a park, and it's good. And now we're talking about, no, it's not just that, it's giving that landscape an additional leg up in terms of restoration by restoring habitat, reintroducing species, um, things that in the past we would not have done. So it strikes me that that's also part of what's different going forward for us in terms of defining success. Yeah, and I think, I mean, this isn't a pristine landscape. This isn't, it isn't like, humans weren't here um, and for thousands of years things were going pretty well in terms of you know yeah. species uh, balance and um, then with again colonization all hell broke loose and we had suppression of fire we had clear cutting of all the old growth forests we had a huge sediments going into our creeks you know, overfishing of all the salmon. So it's really trying to undo even just the past 150 to 200 years of damage um, in order to bolster resiliency in the future as we're dealing with more of these like storm events and wildfire events and things like that. Yeah. Sorry, Tom. Tell us. No, not at all. No, no, no. Yeah, I, I would only add, yeah, in, in what we uh, presented today, you know, we used... Um, almost shorthand to describe what you're talking about. We talked about, you know, just improving habitat function. Yeah. There could be a whole, a whole webinar on what that means in the Santa Cruz mountains. Uh, and you touched on many of them. And uh, the idea of a pond, the idea of hydrologic connectivity, um, yeah. keeping soil in, in the, I'm sorry, it's keeping moisture in the soil. There's so many things that go into the stewardship of the land to improve function. Um, and uh, so, yeah, no, it's, I, I think you're spot on with that. And we have to do more of it faster. <laughs> Absolutely. Scale All up, right. Well, we, go ahead, Tom. Oh, I'd say scale up, just as you said. You said it perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, well, I could ask you all a bazillion questions and there's a whole plan that we've been putting together for that I wanna encourage the audience to go check out because we've just, dabbled with some of these concepts, but I know we probably have a bunch of audience questions and I don't want to give them completely short trips. So I want to invite our colleague, um, Matt Schaefer, to share with us and present to you and um, the two of you questions that have come from our audience during this talk. 
Thank you. Great. It's it's always great to hear um, more detail about how we've come to this moment. Um, there are a lot of questions. Uh, there are several questions on um, the lidar data and we, if it's a, if it's publicly available and where. Um, so that might be a quicker question. Super quick answer. Yes, totally. Um, uh, first start at um, uh, Pacific. Uh, oh boy, no, I'm blanking on the um, on the URL. I'll dig it up for you. It, it's um, the certainly the 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 light the canopy stuff we showed. That's all um, on uh, on a. It's all freely available on a website that I'll share in chat in just a second. Great. That would be great. I'm sure folks would really appreciate it. There were a lot of um, questions about their area and where they could look at that exact data. Yeah. Um, a different question, and and Laura, you just began to touch on this a moment ago. Um, we talked, this webinar has largely been focused on data science and um, for a lot of really good reasons. But what about indigenous science or tribal inclusion in our decision making processes, access to land and co management? How are we looking at integrating uh, indigenous science with data science? Oh my gosh. I, I mean, it's. Uh... It's absolutely essential that we look to indigenous practices um, historically to inform our future practices. Um, obviously, climate is changing, so that the conditions are changing. But um, for so long, these plants and animals co-evolved with land management practices that indigenous people, uh, you know, partook in for thousands of years. So we have some partnerships with, especially the Amamuts and Land Trust their and their Stewardship Corps um, doing certain restoration projects and, and just learning from them about the, the history of the landscape. Um, we uh, also have partnered with Mowekma. I understand this question came from the leader of the Tamian tribe. So thank you, welcome to our, our webinar and um, wish we had more time to connect and would love to connect after this um, with you as well if you wanna share your information with Matt. Sarah, do you have any things to add to that? Well, I would just say in addition to indigenous uh, practices, I think there's a mindset that we've um, begun to uh, learn and try to adopt from our uh, tribal partners. And it just, not that we didn't prior have an understanding of the web of life and the interconnectedness of it all, but really the attitude of um, humans being <laughs> Uh, one of many species, humans as part of nature and not some separate other um, leads you to some very different approaches. And I feel like that um, philosophical uh, or that belief system is one that has started to um, increasingly permeate our approach to the work. And it, it leads you to very different approaches as a result. And I would just add that we also incorporate cultural resources into our acquisition planning and prioritization. Um, and anytime we embark on a restoration project on the ground, um, we do cultural resource surveys. We had a great webinar about that a few months ago and just constantly learning more about you know, these landscapes and how they were tended and how they were kept you know, resilient and biodiverse for so long, um, again, prior to colonization, so. Yeah, it's very important part of our present and future. Perfect, and I'll, I'll leave with one last question, Sarah, um, probably for you. The, um, uh, you mentioned scaling up. Yeah. And can you just say a little bit about what scaling up means? What are we what will we scale up on? I think it's uh, scaling up the work that we do specifically to acquire lands for protection, uh, scaling up the amount of stewardship work that we're doing, and the sort of the breadth of it beyond just uh, things like reintroducing prescribed fire. Um, to do more active intervention like species reintroduction on our properties. And then most significantly, I think we and our partners need to understand how we collectively crack the nut of 
um, broader stewardship across the landscape. And whether that's new and different partnership with other private landowners or um, policy changes that may support uh, connectivity and restoration work across um, multiple private landowners. Um, that's not something we have done a lot of in the past, and yet it's unavoidable that it, that is going to have to be part of the future. Um, and I don't mean to suggest, you know, world domination that we're going to manage all the private lands. It's just to say that private landowners in this region are facing very significant challenges in the stewardship of their properties. And I think collectively, we and others need to be part of finding solutions. So hopefully that answered your question, Matt. Yes, thank you, Sarah. So I'm noticing that we are out of time. Um, I wanna really thank Tom and Laura for joining us. I'm sure we will bring you both back because um, this is an ongoing dialogue. And as I said at the outset, we're sort of lifting up the hood to let people be part of our conversation and evolving thinking around this. And we will continue to educate our supporters and our audience um, because it's something that we all need to understand. Um, so that being said, I hope that you all will join us. You, our audience, will join us next month. Uh, we've got a great and really different um, webinar coming up with Jared Farmer, who just came out with a new book, Elder Flora, that, that is getting some press coverage. Uh, and it will be a conversation with him around redwoods and other long-lived tree species and how uh, different communities and different cultures have interacted with those tree species. So that'll be a very... Um, very different webinar than this one, but great. So please join us for that. Uh, and that one will not be reposted. So please look for specific view times. We're going to have it available for viewing several times and then it will be gone. So uh, watch that one live if you can. Thanks again to Sharf Investments for sponsoring this whole webinar series and to Shepard Mullen for sponsoring this specific episode. And again, to Tom and Laura, uh, thank you for continuing to advise us and push us to um, have the courage to do things differently in response to the realities of climate change. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Mm -hmm.